The topic for our consideration this morning during this period is premillennialism defined and defeated. Brother Robert R. Taylor has declared concerning this important topic that premillennialism is both pernicious and a problem will be successfully denied by none acquainted with its deadly and destructive dogmas. It is neither new nor is it novel. It is a deadly serious system of theological teaching. It is intent in conquering the religious world. It has been around a long time and is still rearing its ugly head within the realm of religion. It is not peculiar to any one religious segment of our time, but freely crosses all lines and welcomes any who will embrace its materialistic concepts and attempts to build again, abolish Judaism. It can be beaten down by the courageous and faithful warriors of Calvary in one generation, only to bounce back with increased vigor for the next generation to face and with which to do battle." End of quote. This entire lectureship will be devoted to the refutation of what Taylor aptly calls the pernicious doctrine of premillennialism. Let no true child of God take the matter lightly, for this doctrine is held by many religious bodies, and it is constantly taught by way of television, radio, newspaper, books, tracts, sermons, classes, and personal work. Those who, who are blinded or even confused by this doctrine are not going to obey the gospel. Indeed, such people cannot obey the gospel because they do not believe that Jesus Christ is now King of kings and Lord of lords. John 8, 24, Acts 2, 36, Revelation 19, 16, and John 18, 36. What premillennialism is? True answers to two crucial questions point up the basic meaning of this term. One, is Christ now king over his kingdom? Or two, will he, that is Christ, at some time in the future reign on a literal throne on the literal earth for a literal 1,000 years? The Bible answers the first question affirmatively. Premillennialists answer it negatively. The Bible answers the second question negatively. Premillennialists answer it affirmatively. Premillennialists hold that the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah and the kingdom which he wants to set up refer to his becoming a political king over a political nation, that is, to an earthly king over an earthly kingdom. This means that premillennialism holds that the Messiah is to rule over fleshly Israel as a political ruler. Further, they hold that the purpose of the first coming of Christ to the earth was for the purpose of setting up that political earthly kingdom in the literal earthly city of Jerusalem in order to reign on a literal earthly throne for a period of 1,000 literal 365-day years. But premillennialists hold because the Israelites as a nation rejected him as king. He was not able to accomplish what he came to accomplish. That is, he was not able to set up or establish that kingdom. Still further, premillennialists hold that since Jesus failed in his initial effort to set up the kingdom, he postponed its establishment and set up the church as a sort of afterthought. Since they hold that the setting up of the kingdom was postponed, premillennialists also hold, one, that Christ will return to earth prior to his being seated on the throne of David, two, that Christ will then be seated on the throne of David, and three, that Christ will reign for 1,000 literal years on the literal earth. The basic burden of this lecture. In this lecture, I plan, one, to show that the basic program of premillennialism is false, that is, that it contradicts plain Bible teaching, and two, to set forth Bible truth concerning Christ, his reign, and his kingdom. Important topics involved in the question. Among the topics which are related in a crucial way to the question of premillennialism are the following, one, the seed. Two, the land of promise. Three, the promise of the restoration of Israel from Babylon. Four, the promise concerning the kingdom over which the Messiah was to rule. More attention will be given to point four than to the other three. This will be done because this point actually destroys premillennialism uh, entirely. In order to provide an adequate basis for the consideration of the basic question with which this lecture is concerned, the following will, will be done. One, part one, the basic program of the premillennialist view will be set out, and two, part two, the basic argument which will be used to set forth the truth of the matter will be explicated. It will be shown, one, that the argument is valid, two, that the premises are true, and three, that therefore the conclusion must be true. Part one, the premillennial program. Based upon a number of prophecies which they had misinterpreted for many centuries before Christ appeared among the Jews as a teacher, the Jews had envisioned the coming of the Messiah who had been promised by those prophecies. They had a deep longing desire for the kingdom which God had promised. 
They were certain that when it was established, they would then have an earthly king who would be able, one, not only to drive the Roman military forces out of their land, but two, also to conquer quickly all others. Among the prophecies which related to this matter are the following. One, those relating to the seed promise, Genesis 3:15, 22, 18, and 2 Samuel 17, verses 12 and 13. Two, those relating to the land promise, Genesis chapters 15 through 17, and chapter 17, 1 through 8. Three, the prophecies concerning the promise of restoration from the land of Babylon, and four, promises relating to the king and his kingdom, 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13, and Isaiah 2, 1 through 4. It must be noted that a vital part of the premillennial program is the contention that the prophecies of the Old Testament indicated that the Messiah was to reign on a literal throne over fleshly Israel in Jerusalem. That is a political root, the coming of Jesus to offer the kingdom to the Jews. Premillennialists hold that because Christ did not measure up to the image which the Jews had of their promised king, most of them rejected him. They further hold that this fact, coupled with his condemnation of the Jews because of their hypocrisy, led to his crucifixion. Thus it is they claim that the Jews crucified the king and rejected his kingdom. The Jews were able to accomplish the crucifixion only by an appeal to the military power of Rome, a nation which the Jews hated with a vengeance because they so severely resented being a conquered people. They could not forget the great history of Israel as a kingdom under David. In those days, Israel was the conqueror, not the conquered. They could not forget the great physical glory of the widespread fame of Solomon and the kingdom over which he ruled. And even though many years passed without the Jews having a king, their hope for such a powerful king ruling by means of military might over glorious earthly kingdom never diminished. There can be little doubt that by this hope they blinded themselves to the spiritual import of the prophecies concerning the king and his kingdom. Later, the basic promise of God concerning this matter and what it had to do with the fact that he would raise up one of David's descendants to be their king will be discussed in more detail. The Jews envisioned only an ordinary, purely human descendant of David, one who would sit on a physical, literal throne on earth, and two who would rule by means of military power. The basic thing in their mind was an earthly kingdom with material wealth and military power. Later it will be seen from the way the Holy Spirit guided the Apostle Peter into explaining the heart of the fulfillment of these promises on the day of Pentecost, just what the spiritual application of them should be. It must be noted that while God had promised that a descendant of David would be raised up to sit on his throne, and that following his resurrection, it had never entered into the minds of the Jews that it would be a crucified and resurrected Messiah who would sit on the throne of David. It is a crucial element in premillennialism today to hold that the Jews were exactly right in this viewpoint. The Jews of the first century had been led to expect, and premillennialists today continue to expect, a kingdom with material wealth and military power. They had a sensual, materialistic view of the kingdom of God, and so do premillennialists today. But it must be noted, according to John 6, that Jesus refused to become that king of kings, or that kind of king. He is a king over a spiritual kingdom, the church. The kingdom postponed and the church established. Premillennialists hold that when Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, Mark 1, 15, it was his purpose to set up immediately the kingdom which had been prophesied by the prophets. However, according to premillennialism, the Jews rejected that kingdom and crucified the king. This view entails the program that if the Jews as a nation had accepted Christ, then one, he would have then and there set up the kingdom with the literal city of Jerusalem as the capital city. Two, the Jews then would have defeated the Romans in a military battle and would have expelled them from the land, and three, the Jews would have been exalted to first place among the nations. So according to this theory, because the kingdom was rejected and the king crucified, the kingdom was postponed and will not be set until the second coming of Christ, and thus his kingdom will be an earthly kingdom as it was originally expected to be by the Jews. An interesting question arises. Is it not significantly strange that if it were the case, as premillennialists claim, that God had revealed through the prophets that the kingdom would not be set until a second coming of Christ, that Jesus himself would have declared that the kingdom was at hand in the opening days of his personal ministry? 
The total situation envisioned by the premillennialist further entails a constituent element that the church of Christ was not in God's original plan. This means that when Christ was rejected as the Jews' king, and when the kingdom was rejected by them as a nation, then the church was set up as a sort of temporary substitute to function until Christ comes again. This view further entails a contention that when Christ comes again, he will have the first stage of his second coming. So according to premillennialism, we are living now in the so-called church age or church dispensation, and during this period of time, the church is an institution in which men are trained to be co-rulers with Christ during the millennial dispensation. They hold that present preaching of the gospel is not an effort to save all men. Rather, it is for the specific purpose of witnessing and calling a definite number who are to compose the body of Christ. The first resurrection. The first resurrection mentioned in Revelation 20 will take place according to premillennialism at the rapture. As per premillennialism, this means when Christ comes for his saints. All saints who have died both during the Old Testament and New Testament periods will be raised from the dead. All saints then living will be changed. This is the so-called first part of the first resurrection. The resurrection of the tribulation saints later will be the second part of the first resurrection. The rapture. According to premillennialism, all the saints, both resurrected and changed, will ascend to meet the Lord in the air. The church age ends at the rapture. The coming of Christ for his saints will be secret. It will be in the night. The rapture is also called the first part of the first stage of the Lord's second coming. The taking of the saints to heaven is called by premillennialists the rapture. The church age of the so-called church dispensation is to end at the rapture or when Christ comes for his saints. The saints in heaven, including the period of the great tribulation. According to premillennialism, after the rapture, the saints will be in heaven with the Lord for seven years. During these seven years, the judgment of the saints will take place. This will involve the giving to each saint his appropriate reward and assigning to each his respective position. Also, during this period, the so-called marriage feast in heaven will be eaten. Then during the last three and one half years of the seven years, there will be the occurrence of the great tribulation on earth. And although all the saints are to be caught up in heaven at the rapture during this period of great tribulation, many people will be converted to Jesus Christ. The Antichrist will appear during these seven years. The saints are with the Lord in heaven. The Jews will then make a covenant with him. Those people who are converted during the seven years that the saints are with Christ in heaven will be killed before the Lord returns. All of them, every one of them, will be killed. Reference is usually made at this point to tribulation saints. The tribulation they hold will be the most severe persecution ever brought upon men. During this period, all of Israel, that is, the national house of fleshly Israel, will be saved. The second coming, the revelation. According to premillennialism, the so-called revelation is to occur simultaneously with the coming of Christ, with his saints, to end the great tribulation. At this point, we might consider the question, if all the pre-tribulation saints are in heaven, and if all the tribulation saints are killed, just who is it that does the converting during this time? This will be the time that the tribulation saints are resurrected, and they are to be regarded as the gleanings of the great harvest of the first resurrection. This will be the time of the second stage of the second coming of Christ. The Gentiles who are living on the earth will be judged and disposed of. Christ will then ascend to the throne of David and be seated as an earthly king of the so-called millennial kingdom, which then will be established. Satan will be bound and sealed in the pit. The tribulation saints will be resurrected, that is, seven years after the other saints are resurrected. This will be the so-called second part of the first resurrection. The kingdom is to be a material earthly kingdom, which lasts for a literal 1,000 years. This kingdom is to begin at the revelation. It is that over which Christ is to rule during his glorious reign on earth for a literal 1,000 years while he is seated on the throne of David. Premillennialists premillennial hold that it is during this time that the Gentiles on earth will be converted. And as we have previously indicated, it will be the time when, according to premillennialists, national Israel will become supreme over all the earth and will occupy the number one spot, militarily speaking, among nations. During the millennium, the saints, members of the church, will be in Jerusalem, Palestine, and will rule as co-rulers with Christ with a rod of iron. Also, during the 1,000 years, Satan is bound. He is to be imprisoned in the pit and to be sealed over, Revelation 20, 1 through 3, Jude, verse 6. During the period of 1,000 years, no one on earth will be subject to temptation. The saints who come with Christ are classified as follows. 
One, those who have suffered martyrdom during the beast's reign. Two, those who have refused to wear the mark and the name of the beast. Now we're ready for part two. The truth about Christ and his kingdom, the basic argument. One, the basic argument stated. The basic argument here being used, one, to set forth the truth about Christ and his kingdom, and two, to refute the essential doctrine of premillennialism as his father's. One, if the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the coronation of Christ all occurred in fulfillment of prophecy, then premillennialism is false. And Christ has been reigning as king since the first day of Pentecost following his resurrection from the dead. Two, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the coronation of Christ all occurred in fulfillment of prophecy. Three, therefore premillennialism is false, and Christ has been reigning as king since the first day of Pentecost following his resurrection from the dead. Number two, the argument explained. This argument is unquestionably valid, since it is a hypothetical syllogism in which the antecedent of the first premise is affirmed. Thus, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Since it is necessary if premillennialism is true for certain sub-doctrines to be true, if even one of these sub-doctrines can be shown to be false, then it will have been shown that premillennialism itself is false. Thus, if it can be shown that the prophecies relating to the death of Christ or to his burial, to his resurrection, or to his ascension, or to his coronation, involve such facts as to show that even one sub-doctrine of premillennialism is false, it will have been shown that premillennialism is false. Along with other matters, it will also be shown that Jesus is now reigning as king over his kingdom. Proof of the argument. Number one, proof of the first premise. Since the antecedent of this hypothetical type proposition is a conjunctive statement, and since to show that any one of the conjuncts of a compound conjunctive proposition is false is to show that the entire compound proposition is false, then to show that any of the elements of the antecedent of this premise is false is to falsify the consequence. In short, the first premise means that if it were the original plan of God and his omniscience, that Christ would come to this earth for a period of only approximately 33 years, as was actually the case recorded in the New Testament, then the core doctrines of premillennialism are false, and Jesus is now reigning as king. To show that the sub-doctrines of the basic doctrines of premillennialism are false, I have only to show the truth concerning the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the coronation of Christ. In doing so, I shall not only show that premillennialism is false, but I shall show that Jesus Christ is now king, reigning over his kingdom. Therefore, it is clear that the first premise is true. Number two, proof of the second premise. The second premise states that if the death, the burial, resurrection, and the ascension of Christ were prophesied as they actually occurred during his earthly ministry, and if he were coronated as king following his ascension, then the minor premise is true. And if the second premise is true, then the sub-doctrines of premillennialism are false. If both premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. This basic conclusion entails a conjunction that premillennialism is false and that Jesus Christ is now reigning as king. I will now proceed to the proof of the various elements of the second premise. One, prophecy made in full fill concerning the death of Christ. From the pen of Isaiah we read, He was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted he opened not his mouth. As a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and as a sheep that before its shares is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who among them considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. This is clearly a prophecy concerning the Messiah. It describes, one, what happened to Christ during his civil and religious trials, and two, the crucifixion which resulted from that trial. All of this can be learned from the latter portion of each of the four Gospels. Acts 8, 31 through 35 makes clear that Philip, the inspired evangelist, who preached to the man of Ethiopia, pointed out that the death of Christ and attendant events constituted the fulfillment of this very passage, that is, Isaiah chapter 53. Thus it is clear that the Holy Spirit for the pen of Isaiah indicated that Christ came not to live and reign on earth over a military power for 1,000 literal years, but to be crucified just as the records in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and other New Testament books indicate that he was. 
This alone shows that the theory of premillennialism is false. Christ died according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Acts 2, 23, not as a result of an unexpected rejection as per premillennial doctrine. Number two, prophecies made and fulfilled concerning his burial. The prophet Isaiah also says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and neither was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah 53, 9. Among the New Testament passages which show the actual fulfillment of this prophecy are the following, Matthew 27, 57 through 60, Luke 23, 53, Mark 15, 46, John 19, 42, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Christ was crucified between two thieves and was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. Number three, prophecies made and fulfilled concerning his resurrection. The psalmist gives us the following message. For thou wilt not leave my soul to Sheol, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Psalm 16:10. According to the apostle Peter, as recorded in Acts 2, 22 and 23, this passage was fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter affirmed that he and the other apostles were witnesses of that resurrection. Therefore, it is clear that he was not that it was not the plan of God that Christ should come to reign on earth a literal 1,000 years, but that he should be crucified at the end of a brief ministry on earth, just as he was, and be raised from the dead, just as he was, before he had been dead long enough for his flesh to corrupt. This point alone proves that the theory of premillennialism is false. Number four, prophecy made and fulfilled concerning his coronation. Daniel 7, 13, and 14 is pertinent both to the resurrection and to the coronation. Daniel 2, 44 should also be carefully considered. Daniel 7, 13, and 14 makes clear, number one, that subsequent to the ascension of Christ and his entrance into heaven, dominion and glory in the kingdom were given to him. Two, that all of the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And three, that his dominion was to be an everlasting, age-lasting dominion. In fulfillment of this prophecy, Acts 2, 1 through 47, clearly teaches, one, that the kingdom was set up on the first day of Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, and two, that he became king over a spiritual kingdom, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew 16, 13 through 18, and not over some military, material, earthly kingdom with a political throne in Jerusalem. The marvelous teaching of the second chapter of Acts in connection with the matter at hand will be considered now. Number five, a special look at Acts chapter 2. Some initial considerations. First, during the ministries of John and Jesus, the kingdom was at hand. Before considering the details of Acts 2, it will be of value to note that there was a time of preparation for the kingdom, which began with the work of John the Baptist, which continued with the work of Christ and his twelve apostles. Matthew 1 through 3 introduces Mary as the mother of Jesus, who was begotten by the Holy Spirit. In a statement which the priests and the scribes made to Herod, Matthew 2, 1 through 6 makes clear that the Messiah, the governor who was, uh, the governor who was to rule the people, was to be born in the city of Bethlehem, in the province of Judea. In Matthew chapter 3, the fact that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, about to be established, was announced by John. The work of John as a forerunner had been predicted by Isaiah, Isaiah 43. She also Mark 1, 14 and 15, and Matthew 3, verse 3. Even though John the Baptist lived and died before the church of Christ was established, and even though he was never a citizen of the kingdom, it is still the case that during his ministry he announced that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Matthew 3, verses 1 through 3. The expression at hand does not mean that the kingdom was already set up. If it meant such, then the kingdom was not set up by Christ. Yet we know that Christ did set up or build the kingdom, the church, Matthew 16, 13 through 18. The expression at hand was certainly future in its basic connotation. The day to which the expression at hand referred was future, up until the day of Pentecost. The kingdom was certainly future when John the Baptist preached that it was at hand. It was also future immediately following the time that Jesus was baptized and entered upon his personal and public ministry. This is seen to be the case because Jesus also preached that men should repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4, 17. But after the day of Pentecost, the kingdom was already in existence, Colossians 1, 13. From that day, the kingdom is referred to as existent, Acts 2, 22 through 27. All the elements that are necessary for the kingdom to be in existence came to be on the first day of Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. Thus, the kingdom was established on that day. The expression at hand never refers to a time that was past. 
Neither does the expression refer to a time that is in the far distant future. 600 years before the birth of Christ, Daniel said that God would set up the kingdom, Daniel 2.44. But Daniel did not say that it was at hand at the time he wrote the prophecy. At that time, the kingdom was more than 600 years in the future. But when the time was fulfilled and the kingdom was about to appear, it was said to be at hand. The time was not fulfilled at the time when Daniel wrote that it would be set up, for it was more than 600 years in the future at that time. But Jesus did say the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, Mark 1, 15. The Lord did not say that the time would be fulfilled 2,000 years later. He said that the time is fulfilled. Premillennialists presently tell us that time is not yet come. But the writer of Hebrews said that they received the kingdom in the first century, Hebrews 12, 28. A crucial question which should be asked at this point is, when was the so-called failure of the kingdom announced? The biblical answer is, it never was announced. One can go through the gospel records from the time of the trial of Christ and confirm the truth that there is no statement to the effect that the kingdom was to be postponed. Christ made it clear that the kingdom would be set up during the time of some who lived during his, Christ's, own earthly ministry. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There are some here of them that stand by, who shall in no wise taste of death, till they see the kingdom of Christ come with power. Mark 9, 1. Unless some who were living at the time Jesus made this statement are still living, the kingdom already has been established. Since no such person is still living on earth, the kingdom has already been established. According to the sixth chapter of John, the Jews, with their vision of military kingdom, were about to try to force Jesus to become a king who would function as a rival to Caesar in order to defeat the armies of Rome. But Jesus rejected their efforts, John 6, 15. The following facts are tremendously significant. One, the Jews, with their vision of an earthly kingdom, wanted Jesus to be a civil king with a military force over that earthly, secular kingdom. Two, if Jesus' mission to the Jews had involved such a kingdom, then they, the Jews, would have accepted him. They would have received him. Three, but since Jesus came with a very purpose in mind of setting up the kind of kingdom which he actually then set up, as our study of prophecy has shown, then the Jews rejected him. Consider John 1, 11 through 13, and chapter 18, 33 through 37. Makes clear that in effect Jesus is king of truth. This means that his kingdom in its basic nature is spiritual, not material, is heavenly and not earthly. Even Pilate understood this. Note John 18, 38. Pilate's reaction to Jesus' claim gives credence to the view that he, that is Pilate, considered Jesus to be some sort of visionary dreamer who thought he was king of truth, that is, the king over a spiritual kingdom, and therefore no rival at all of Caesar, who was ruler over a military power. Even during his trial, and therefore just prior to the crucifixion, Jesus plainly predicted that he would be king at the right hand of God, Luke twenty-two sixty-nine. He gave absolutely no hint of any postponement of the kingdom. Thus it is clear that both the Roman governor and the Jewish leaders understood Jesus to be making a claim concerning the kingdom, which was clearly out of harmony with the desires and expectations of the Jews themselves. While he was on trial before Pilate, Jesus was accused by the Jews of claiming to be a king. The Jews tried to leave Pilate with the impression that Jesus was claiming to be a king who was a rival to Pilate's own emperor, Caesar. However, the Jews knew that they were bearing false witness. They knew that Jesus had made no such claim. As a matter of fact, it was for the very reason that the Jews' charge was false that they delivered him to Pilate. If the charge had been true, that is, if Jesus really had been claiming to be such a king, a rival to Caesar, then in connection with all the mighty works which he had done before them, they would have hailed him as their king. This is the case because he then would have been the very kind of king they wanted. But since he was not that kind of king, they rejected him and delivered him up to be crucified. And at this very point in the trial, Luke 23, 3, Pilate asked Jesus, Are you a king? And Jesus replied in effect, Yes, I am. There are at least these things which stand out about this incident. When the Jews accused Jesus of claiming to be a king over an earthly kingdom with a military force as a rival to the emperor of Rome, two, the Jews knew that this accusation was false. They knew he was claiming to be king over a spiritual kingdom. Four, Jesus knew that the accusation was false. He knew that he was claiming to be king over a spiritual kingdom, not over a political one. And five, rather than claiming some postponement was now to occur because the Jews had rejected him through the very last moments before his death, 
death, Jesus still claimed by implication to be king, that is, to become such on the day of Pentecost shortly following. Now a look at Luke 23, verses 15 and 16. Having no legal authority to put Jesus to death, the Jews brought Jesus before the Roman governor and made accusations against him. They accused Jesus of, one, perverting the Jewish nation, two, forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, three, claiming to be a king in rivalry to Caesar, and four, stirring up the people throughout all Judea. After a preliminary examination or trial, Pilate plainly stated that he found no fault in Jesus. Pilate then asked Jesus, Art thou king of the Jews? Jesus answered affirmatively. Having found no fault at this point, Pilate should have released Jesus. However, he sent Jesus to Herod, who had public jurisdiction over the area from which Jesus came. Herod found no fault in Jesus and sent him back to Pilate. Pilate then told the Jews that while they had accused Jesus of perverting the people, he, Pilate, had found no fault in him. He made clear that neither he nor Herod had found him guilty of doing anything which warranted the death sentence. Thus, since according to the Roman law, claiming to be a king as a rival to Caesar was a crime which would have been worthy of death, it is clear that Pilate had exonerated Jesus from claiming to be that kind of king. The true claim of Jesus must not be forgotten. The facts stated in John 18, 33 through 37 must be recalled. Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? Jesus replied, did, did others tell you this? Pilate said, your own nation delivered you to me. And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. So Pilate asked, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, In effect, Yes, I am. To this end did I come into the world. This means that he came into the world to be king over a spiritual kingdom. That is, the kingdom of truth, a kingdom which deals with salvation from sin. It was not to be a civil kingdom with military power, etc., According to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, after his resurrection, Jesus made appearances to various persons. This activity covered a period of some 40 days, Acts 1, 3. During this time, he spoke concerning the kingdom of God. And there is absolutely no reason to conclude that Jesus was talking about the kingdom being postponed. No doubt he was indicating, one, that the kingdom was to be established, and two, that such was to occur soon. Consider Mark 9, 1 and Luke 24, 44 through 49. Further, according to Acts 1, verse 6, the apostles asked the Lord, Lord, dost thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It seems that even the apostles who were Jews still expected an earthly kingdom. In reply, among other things, Jesus said, Ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. It should be recalled that the kingdom wants to come with power, and the power wants to come with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the kingdom wants to come with the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit came on the day of Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, Acts 2, 1 through 4. If the church and the kingdom are one and the same institution, and they are, and if the church can be shown to have been established on the first day of Pentecost after, after the resurrection of Christ, and it was, then it came to be shown that the kingdom was established on Pentecost. In the course of what follows, this conclusion, among other things, will be established. And Brother Warren cites us to the book of Acts, chapter 2, uh, verses 22 and verses 36. And this particular section involves the preachers that were present on the occasion and also the audience that was present. And then he cites us to a look at Acts, the second chapter, specifically verses 25 through 35, as well as Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And then as we go along, let it be remembered that God does not lie. Hebrews 6, 18, Titus 1, 2, 1 Samuel 15, 29. There are neither exceptions nor contingencies as concerns those matters which God foresees and plans in his overall scheme. No failures or changes are planned. No failures or changes can be tolerated, that is, in his overall scheme. Consider Matthew 12, 41. Since in this instance Peter makes it clear that God foresaw the resurrection of Jesus as an act which was both precedent to the preparatory and to 
who is being crowned king, seated on the throne of David, that is, it is the height of folly to talk, as premillennialists do, of his having come to take that throne before he died. Premillennialism is something far more than a mere harmless belief, as some would have us believe. While it might be claimed counterfactually that single, that single era, that Christ will reign on a literal earth for a literal thousand years, does not truly mutilate the gospel of Christ, it is absurd to deny that the foundation of premillennialism certainly does mutilate the gospel of Christ. This is the case because the foundation of premillennialism is that Jesus came intending that John preached and that God planned and purposed, one, that Jesus would be seated on the throne of David before and without dying, and two, that the Jews correctly understood this matter. Of course, this constitutes fundamental error. If anyone counters by saying that he believes premillennialism but does not believe the fundamental error which has been set out here, its foundation, then the correct reply is that he does not fully understand uh, the doctrine he claims to believe. Lest someone argue that prophecies concerning the kingdom and his kingdom were not fulfilled, that is, that the death, burial, resurrection, coronation were not matters of prophecy, I call attention to a number of passages. Luke chapter 24, Acts 13, also Acts 24, 26, and 28. All of these passages make clear that the things which happened to Jesus during his earthly ministry were matters of Old Testament prophecy. Premillennialism does not fit with the Bible. The view that Jesus became king on Pentecost fits with Bible truth. But some may object even if they should admit uh, that what has been argued above disproves the anti-scriptural view that Jesus held that he was going to become king on the throne of David over fleshly national Israel while he was here on earth before and without his death and resurrection that it had not been proved that Christ already had been seated on that throne. This means that they hold that the verses which have been from Acts chapter 2 thus far do not prove such. But now verse 33 must be noted. Being therefore with the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which ye see and hear. Some have argued that while Christ was raised from the dead to sit on the throne and will eventually be seated on that throne, this does not constitute proof that he already has been seated on that throne. But in saying that Jesus was at the right hand of God exalted, Peter was saying that Jesus had become king, that he was at that very moment on his throne. Peter said on Pentecost that Christ had been exalted. Now, finally, what was the power of this line of argument? It was so powerful that thousands of Jews who had a part in the crucifixion of Christ repented of their wickedness and came to the decision to have Christ to rule as king in their lives. They obeyed the gospel being baptized into him, Acts 2.41. Thus it can be seen that the minor premise of the basic argument has been proved. This has been done by proving that each of the elements of the compound conjunction which comprise the minor premise is true. Thus, since I have proved both premises of a valid argument, I have proved the conclusion the doctrine of premillennialism is false, and Jesus is now reigning as king. Thus, since it has been proved that the basic argument involved is valid, and two, that the premises of that argument are true, the following is, has been proved. One, the doctrine of premillennialism is false. And two, Jesus Christ is now reigning as king over his kingdom, the church of the Lord, the church of the living God.